Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, for the second speaker here. Uh, we're going to uh, continue on with our misconceptions of or hindsight 2020 misconceptions. Uh, we are going to uh, introduce Vanessa Smiley, who is a historian and interpreter whose roots began at the national parks. Her Rev War Park experience includes the Southern Campaign of the American Revolution, Parks Group, Guilford Courthouse, National Military Park, and Morristown National Historic Site. Uh, Vanessa is currently the project manager of interpretive media development for the National Capital Area at Harpers Ferry Center. She received her bachelor's degree in historic preservation from the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and her master's degree in resource interpretation from Stephen F. Austin State University in Texas. She enjoys researching family histories, drinking craft beer, and helping animals of all kinds. We welcome Vanessa as she presents American Revolutionary War from the Bottom Up, Southern Theater Misconceptions. Thank you so much, Phil. All right, everyone. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. I um, am hopefully going to be talking to you guys a little bit about the Southern Theater and some misconceptions that go along with it. Um, so let me first kind of go over what we consider the Southern theater seems pretty straightforward enough and it, it pretty much is. Um, so the Southern, in the Southern theater includes um, military engagements that took place in the Southern colonies. And I know in the previous presentation, somebody asked about kind of the mid Atlantic colonies. What do we consider kind of the middle of the colonies and um, uh, Virginia is uh, one of those that was discussed. And uh, at least for the course of this presentation, I focus predominantly on the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. Um, there's just a lot of substance to dive into just with those. And um, I figured uh, we can talk about the Virginias in a different sense at another point in time, um, but it, that, this doesn't have too much of an effect on some of the misconceptions that I'll be discussing today. Um, just know that when I'm talking about the Southern campaign or Southern theater, um, or I'm talking about Southern battles, um, I really don't touch on any of the Virginia conflicts. So just be aware that I, I haven't intentionally or rather unintentionally forgotten about Virginia. It's, it's kind of on purpose. Um, and the Southern theater gained prominence in the second half of the war. And this is what becomes known as the Southern campaign. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. So first, um, what I did was I spent the last probably year and a half asking any and all of the non-history nerd folks that I knew about various things relating to the Revolutionary War, particularly in the South. And this was not a scientific survey by any means. This was literally just casual conversations that I would uh, approach with family, friends, some neighbors. Uh, so re real informal, real casual, not scientific in any way, but it was really eye-opening to me. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of that, obviously during the presentation, but I'm gonna add a disclaimer here. And that is that the people I spoke with, they came from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of ages and educations. Um, I would not label these people as uneducated or uninformed, but I do think their responses and some of the feedback I got is indicative of the fact that we're facing an uphill battle to engage the general public in the knowledge, understanding, and stewardship of the stories of the American Revolution. And you'll see some of that later on in the presentation. Now, the photos you see on the slide here um, I specifically chose these photos because I felt they were appropriate about how we're going to need to get creative with how we educate the general public about the Rev War, particularly as we're nearing the 250th. And these three images were memes uh, that I created back when I was Chief of Interpretation at Morristown or Chief of Visitor Services for Morristown. And I created these for their Facebook page. And this was a means to educate our virtual visitors, our digital audiences on Rev War topics in a manner that folks might be able to connect with. Um, so this was right before the National Park Service Centennial, which was uh, a huge you know, celebration, but a primary purpose for, or a primary motivation for the Centennial was to help engage the next generation of park stewards. So I was trying to be funny but educational at the same time. 
Whether I hit the mark or not, I'll let you guys be the judge of that. But that's something that we're going to have to consider uh, if we're going to maintain relevancy uh, for the general audience in the future. So let me go into the first miscon misconception. There were no significant battles in the South before 1780. So I got comments like, you know, didn't everything kind of happen in New York and, and Pennsylvania and that was kind of it. But, oh, but the South, they had some stuff, right? That was later on in the war. That's when things were happening. So just a real mix of not even really sure what happened in the South before 1780. And the fact of the matter is there was plenty going on in the South before 1780. Um, now, please note that the battles that I'll mention here are not an exhaustive list. There are many more. I just highlighted some ones that I felt had um, enough of, a, of an impact on the grand scheme of things that they were worth mentioning. So the first is the first battle of 96, which is also known as the Siege of Savage's Old Fields. Um, this was uh, 1775, November of 1775. And this was actually the first land battle south of New England for the Red War. This was when uh, Patriot forces under uh, Williamson were dispatched to recover a shipment of gunpowder and ammunition that was intended for the Cherokee, but it had actually been seized by loyalists. And you see um, the photo from both the previous slide and this little piece here that you see on the slide there. This is um, a painting of uh, Williamson's fort. It was essentially just a simple stockade that the Patriots defended uh, at 96. And after several days of battle, uh, it, it actually ended in a truce. But this was the start of what became known as the Snow Campaign. So this was in December of 1775. So here we are, we're still five years before the 1780 number. Um, and this was a Patriot campaign against loyalists in South Carolina. Essentially, uh, Patriot militia, um, several thousand Patriot militia marched against uh, loyalists in order to uh, it, disrupt, I guess is a good word, disrupt recruiting efforts from loyalists to try to get support for uh, the loyalist side. Um, the Snow Campaign, as you can probably tell by the name, the Snow Campaign was called that because of the snow that ended up occurring that kind of uh, slowed down the efforts of those patriots. Um, but you get into uh, some of North Carolina, the Battle of Morse Creek in February of 1776, kind of towards the end of the Snow Campaign, this was a very quick but decisive Patriot victory. It struck a huge blow to that Loyalist recruitment in North Carolina. And we'll talk a little bit more about Morris Creek later on, but I did write a blog post for the Emerging Rev War um, on Morris Creek, which I thought it was very fascinating, but it kind of goes into a little bit more of some of the significance of Morris Creek in the grand scheme of things. The next battle is the Battle of Sullivan's Island, June 28, 1776. So this is in South Carolina. It's sometimes known as the first siege of Charleston. This was a, a Patriot victory. The British attacked Charleston uh, and uh, they were defeated. And this is gonna be one of the last major British operations in the South until 78, till, uh, 1778. Excuse me. Uh, next battle, Battle of Thomas Creek, May 17th, 1777. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this later, but this was a British victory. Uh, we also have the Battle of Alligator Bridge in uh, 1778. That is also a British victory, and that's taking place in Florida. And again, we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, Battle of Kettle Creek, February 14th, 1779. So we're getting kind of later into the war, but we're still technically before 1780. This was a Patriot victory, and we will touch a little bit more on Kettle Creek in a little bit. And then there's the Siege of Savannah, September to October 1779, again in Georgia. Continental Army is teaming up with the French, but they do fail to recapture Savannah from the British. And then that's when we finally start getting into that 1780 number, and that's when the Southern Campaign, what we know as the Southern Campaign, more or less kicks off. It kicks off with uh, the fall of Charleston, to the British in May of 1780. Uh, so again, plenty of things are happening um, in the South well before this kind of 1780 um, Southern campaign kicks off. So now let's jump into this misconception number two that kind of popped up a, a lot more than I expected, which was that basically nothing happened in Georgia other than Savannah. 
and Florida didn't, Florida essentially didn't exist. I had a couple of people ask, wait, when did Florida become a colony that, that they had something going on? So I wanted to dive into that misconception a little bit. So you'll know from the previous list of battles I just went through, this isn't true, this misconception isn't true. Both Georgia and Florida had influential battles in kind of the grand scheme of things. Um, so as much as I love anybody who knows me or knows the uh, stuff I write for uh, Emerging Rev War, you know I love to talk about the Carolinas, but Georgia and Florida still had some critical impacts on the war. So let's first talk about Georgia politics. Georgia was doing pretty well under royal rule, but the loyalties were divided in the colony of Georgia. But many folks felt that they needed British help to defend against attacks from American Indians. You also had Savannah, which was a pretty well off uh, port city. Um, so they, they didn't even send a representative to the first Continental, Continental Congress in Phil Philadelphia in uh, 1774. Now they did end up sending one delegate to the second Continental Congress. Tensions, um, it, which was in May of 75, tensions were rising at this point, especially uh, in May around the same time as the second Continental Congress, um, there was a seizure of gunpowder from the powder magazine in Savannah. So, um, so tensions are really starting to build despite this kind of overall general support of, um, of British rule over the colony. It's in the back country, which is a common theme in the southern colonies. It's the back country, and it's specifically in Georgia, around the areas of like Augusta, where tensions were really rising because you had still a decent amount of uh, conflicting support, depending on which side you were on. And it's the back country that becomes the hotbed. And in Georgia, things kind of really kick off um, it, with these heightened tensions with the Battle of the Rice Boats. It's also known as Battle of Yamacraw uh, Bluff. And this was March 2nd to 3rd, 1776. Essentially in January of that year, British warships had begun arriving in Savannah Harbor. And that kind of pissed off some of the Patriot supporters. And so they actually um, took the Royal Governor, James Wright, they arrested him, uh, but he did escape and he did make his way onto one of those sh British warships. And as they began to make their way up the Savannah River, uh, the Patriot militia began firing on them from those bluffs. And um, that's when this battle took place. Um, several ships were burned, the rest escaped. And the, one of the ones that escaped included uh, or had on it the Governor Wright. And this would mark the end of British control over Georgia um, until Savannah was recaptured two and a half years later. So let's briefly talk about the capture of Savannah, December 1778. So the British are, uh, will take back Savannah, Governor Wright will return, and then Savannah's gonna stay in British hands until 1782. Now, before Savannah ends uh, its British occupation, you've got a couple of other battles that are gonna be taking place, not around Savannah in Georgia. Uh, one of which is the Battle of Kettle Creek, uh, February 14th, 1779. This was when uh, some loyalist militia were heading to Augusta, which uh, was where they were mustering with some other um, British and loyalist uh, militia. And they were attacked by the Patriots. So the Patriots caught them off guard, considered a Patriot victory. But then less than a month later, you have the Battle of Briar Creek. And that was mostly militia Patriot forces that uh, were surprised by a force of British army and loyalist militia, and they were defeated. So this was a British victory. So you've got some, uh, some activity going on in the back country, some back and forth. And then later on that year, you have the, that siege of Savannah uh, in September, October, 79. And that's when continental forces were trying to take back Savannah, but they failed. Like I said, we mentioned this before. And then you have, again, kind of a little more into the back country of the time, the Siege of Augusta, May through June, uh, 1781. This is when Andrew Pickens and the ever so famous Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee attacked uh, British occupied Augusta and uh, the Patriots uh, defeated the British. And then you dive into a year later in 72, Savannah ends up back in Patriot hands, like I mentioned before. The war by 1870, or I'm sorry, by 1782, wasn't doing well in the South. And so Governor Wright is ordered by the British to evacuate the city in June. And the next month, the city is evacuated. And let me make sure that was 
everything. There we go. So Georgia was often a hotbed of staging for both Patriot and loyal forces. So not only did Georgia have that large port city of Savannah, but it's also sandwiched between um, everything going on in South Carolina, as well as um, some things that were going on in British controlled Florida. So let's talk about Florida. Florida, I call this the tale of two Floridas. Florida was separated into two colonies during the American Revolution. You have East Florida and you have West Florida. And both were under British control and they remained mostly loyal to Britain. Uh, so these aren't considered uh, one of, or part of that kind of colony of rebellion because uh, these uh, two states colonies or United States states until much later. We'll, and I'll touch on that here in just a minute. But the British had gotten both East and West Florida from Spain at the conclusion of the French and Indian War. But at the end of the American Revolution, uh, Britain's actually gonna give those back to Spain. But again, we'll talk about that in a second. So East Florida's capital was St. Augustine and West Florida's capital was Pensacola. And there's a couple of um, key battles that do take place in Florida. I mentioned those before. There's the Battle of Thomas Creek, May 17th, 1777. Um, this took place in what is now the county of Nassau, just south of the city of Callahan. And this was a mix of troops from the Continental Army and Georgia militias. And they were on a mission to capture and occupy St. Augustine. But they were stopped by a uh, British Army, by the British Army and a group of militia called the East Florida Rangers. They were a cavalry unit. And um, there's still actually a large contingent of reenactors. Um, who portray the East Florida Rangers, and they go all over the South um, providing education about uh, Florida and the American Revolution and um, information about militia and cavalry. Now, the American forces uh, flee when they are attacked by the British Army and the East Florida Rangers. Uh, they retreat. They didn't have a whole lot of supplies, so they retreated partially because of that and um, partially because of the oppressive heat that is Florida in May uh, during the year. So that was a, a failed attempt at taking St. Augustine. The next battle I'll mention is the Battle of Alligator Bridge, which is June 30th, 1778. Um, we're here in East Florida still. And this is the only engagement that they really try to um, take the entire, like they're trying to get East Florida from the British. They're trying to take over the colony, not just a, 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 a city. They fail. And so this stays in British hands. Now let's move over into West Florida a little bit. And that is this with the siege of Pensacola. This is in March and May of 1781. Um, and this is the Spanish actually. Um, they're taking advantage of the fact that um, the Brit Britain is at war with its re uh, rebelling colonies. And so um, they try to take back control of Pensacola and West Florida from the British. And they succeed on May 10th, 1781. Uh, Pensacola officially comes under control of the Spanish and it actually remains in control by Spain for the next 40 years. Um, when the American Revolution ends uh, just a year later or two years later, Britain returns um, uh, the Florida colonies to Spain in order to keep control of Gibraltar. And like I mentioned before, the creation of the United States doesn't include the colonies of East and West Florida. They stay Spanish territories until um, about 40 years later in the 1820s when um, they uh, finally become territories of the United States and then eventually become uh, states themselves. And what's important about um, and what's important about Florida is that it provides a really great strategic location for the British because it can serve as a launching point for tro for troops for their troops to be able to march up into say Georgia or the Carolinas. but also it protected the Caribbean colonies from the rebelling American colonies um, and try kind of created a little bit of a buffer for them. So that's the story of Florida and Georgia in the American Revolution. Again, the most briefest of stories about those two colonies or those three colonies. 
So what about this misconception? This was basically the biggest misconception that I uh, kind of found is that everything was happening in the North. Everything was one in the North. It's because of the North that, and everything that happened up there that uh, we are um, uh, the only reason we won the war. So you can see, um, uh, and thanks to the musical Hamilton, um, more of this misconception is reaching a modern audience. So let's talk about the fact that the Southern theater had as much impact on the war as the Northern theater, as those Northern colonies. Let's talk about Southern politics first. Now, the politics of Boston and New York, they were just one driving force behind the start of the war. You have taverns and town halls in Charleston and Savannah that are having that same influx of uh, revolutionary ideas. And they're adding fuel to that overall idea of, let's start this revolution. Um, the politics in the South are largely controlled by the wealthy, not surprising, um, such as plantation owners and any sort of like shipping tycoons that are taking advantage of this vigorous trade and crop system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And these politics are centered around economic hubs like large cities and ports. These are also the people who are more likely to be directly affected by the British taxation laws. And they were just as unhappy about those taxation laws as those that were affected by them in the North. You have many more loyalist sentiments um, from those that were maybe less involved, and this is a generic statement, but maybe less involved in the large economic business and politics. And this is namely those in the back country. <clears throat> and it's those loyalist hopes that led the British to attempt to kind of start the war focused on the South instead of the North. <clears throat> Excuse me. Months before its colonies officially adopted the Declaration of Independence, the British Army was reaching a really critical juncture in its war strategy um, as things are starting to get real tense. You know, the colonies are in, you know, talking about rebellion. Where should the British strategy be focused? They needed a stronghold in the colonies that would gain them resources, like men and supplies, um, access for their ships, so ports where their ships could come in to bring in British troops. So they initially looked south. The general impression of the Southern colonies was that they were maybe a little more poor, a little more weak than their sister colonies in the North. There was also um, the idea that, hey, you've got all these heavy loyalist sympathies in the back country of South Carolina, the coastal areas of North Carolina. I mean, these are where large populations of German and Scottish immigrants had settled. So, you know, there's some hope there that um, the British can get a really good stronghold. So by the fall of 1775, loyalist recruitment was going quite well. I mean, that's why we have, for example, that first battle of 96, you know, there's um, a, an effort to disrupt some of the loyalist efforts, some of the snow campaign, disrupting the loyalist recruitment. So um, even though the battle of the first battle of 96 ended in a truce, the British confidence was still really high at that point in time. Um, I mean, who wouldn't want to capture some of those wealthy colonial ports like Savannah or Charleston for their fabulous Navy, Navy to be able to dock at with more and more troops? I mean, this was still a possibility. But remember, some of those early battles in the South, some of them were pretty significant defeats. They just couldn't, even though this one was a truce, they just couldn't get that stronghold. So like I mentioned, the Battle of Morse Creek in February of 1776, this was a, a very quick, decisive battle, like I'd mentioned before, and the, this victory struck such a huge blow to Loyalist recruitment in North Carolina. So much so that two months later, North Carolina's delegates at the Continental Congress were the first to vote for independence. Um, whether there's a direct cause or correlation, um, you'll have to read the blog post that I wrote to, to learn more information about that. But this was a really significant defeat in the grand scheme of things because of its impact on the loyalist ability to be able to recruit um, for the British cause. You also have the defeat with the Battle of the Rice Boats at Savannah, the defeat during the Battle of Sullivan's Island in Charleston. So no longer could the British see the Carolinas as easy targets. It was 
just not as easy as they were hoping or they thought it would be. So they abandoned the initial, initial Southern strategy to focus their resources on the war in the Northern colonies. And that kind of the truth for the next three years. Also in the Southern theater, you have this added dichotomy of our first true American civil war that played out in the back countries of the Carolinas. If you know me or know anything about the way I talk about the American Revolution, you will know that I will say that it was during the American Revolution that the first true American Civil War took place. Even though we call the Civil War from the 1860s um, the American Civil War, this was the first true Civil War. You have literal neighbors, brothers, cousins, friends taking up arms to serve their respective causes and they're finding themselves on off opposite sides. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I will happily talk to any of you about all of those reasons, but since I have to keep this to a certain amount of time, I'm gonna move on, but just know that um, there was a lot going on in the back countries that added um, a lot of heat to the fire of the Southern theater. And it was these dynamics that were a big driving force behind the militias that had such a big impact on the Southern campaigns. A lot of it was a grassroots effort. While the Continental Army is shouldering plenty, I'm not saying they weren't, it was a combination of local efforts with the militia and determined civilians that would ultimately turn the tide of the war when the British finally looked to the Southern colonies or when the British did look to the Southern colonies, especially in the second half of the war. And this is where uh, you've got Kings Mountain and Cowpens. Um, those are ones uh, uh, Phil mentioned in my introduction. I used to work at those sites. Um, the Battle of Kings Mountain was, uh, Thomas Jefferson called it, uh, the uh, turning point of the American Revolution where you have predominantly militias who are battling it out on, on Kings Mountain and ultimately the, the Patriots succeed. Um, and then at the Battle of Cowpens, you've got uh, Daniel Morgan taking advantage of a misconception, another misconception thrown in there, of a misconception by the British that the militia were untrained um, and cowardly and would you know turn tail and run at any time when the battle would get too intense. Uh, and this is a rightfully so, asterisk, rightfully so assumption because the British had seen it in previous battles. But at the Battle of Cowpens, Morgan uses it to his advantage to lull the British forces into a false sense of security as the militia fled the battlefield um, and uh, the British uh, pursued them and then came upon the Continentals who were ready and waiting. So, um, so there's a lot going on in the Southern theater, in the Southern campaigns that are directly affecting the impact, the results of the war. So those are the only three misconceptions that I'm really gonna address today because um, there's a lot, but again, I only have so much time. So I wanted to touch a little bit about what is the cause of these misconceptions? Where does this, these misconceptions come from? Um, now, obviously I have some theories. You know, people know Lexington and Concord and Saratoga and Valley Forge and yeah, even Yorktown, whether you consider Virginia a Southern colony or Mid-Atlantic, but why don't people know Savannah? Okay, maybe they know a little bit about, about Savannah, but what about 96? What about Kings Mountain? Heck, what about Florida? The fact that, you know, Florida actually existed at the time. So I do have some of my own theories. I would love to at some point have a discussion about your theories at some point, but here are mine. First is schools. Now, before I go any further, don't hate on the teachers. <laughs> I am in no way blaming the wonderful teachers who have taken on the task of educating our youth they are dealt with difficult hands with very few resources and they do the best with what they have. So this is not hating on the teachers, but schools seem to be teaching more Northern campaign than Southern. And this generalized statement that I've just said um, is my own hypothesis after studying multiple state curriculums as well as informal polling of just some teacher colleagues about their use of the curriculum in the, in the classroom. And the reason that they might be um, not doing quite as much education on the Southern campaign or the Southern theater is a lack of time. The North stuff 
all the Northern engagements, all the Northern politics. I mean, you've got the Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia. I mean, all of these things are happening in the first half of the war for the most part. So it's really easy to highlight those big things that happened first early on when you're teaching. But then teachers run out of time because they're overworked and underpaid and they're all trying to um, basically get uh, their students to pass standardized tests. So there's a lot of glazing over that happens. Now, again, this is a very generalized statement. It's not meant to um, be solid fact, but it's just from what I was gathering from studying state curriculum and looking at actual um, classroom uh, curriculum practices to see that you kind of hit, yeah, start of the war, um, some of the politics leading up to the war, start of the war, and then things happened and then you get to Yorktown and then you have to move on. You have to hit the highlights. and um, So there's a lot of, like I said, focus on standardized testing. Another potential theory of what causes these misconceptions is popular culture. I mean, do I even need to go further when I just say Hamilton and the movie, The Patriot? Okay, I'll go a little bit further, but the, the musical Hamilton and the movie, The Patriot, um, even though The Patriot talks a lot about battles that are similar to say the Battle of Cowpens, like in the final battle scene. And it does talk about the politics of um, the Carolinas. It does get into a little bit of that. It's still a work of fiction. It's still very dramatized. It's still very Hollywood, not necessarily actual fact. And then the musical Hamilton, while it did a great service in getting youth excited and interested about a history that is almost 250 years old, or that is 250 years old, it does a lot to focus on one segment of the American Revolution. And granted, the movie or the musical isn't called, you know, the Rev War, it's called Hamilton. So it's talking specifically where Hamilton um, had uh, a lot of influence or where he was over the course of his life. But again, it's still kind of feeding in some of these misconceptions. Another theory I had was tourism. And this kind of ties into a couple of different things, location and marketing. So location, lots of Rev War sites are not located close to major tourism areas in the South. The exception of course is like Charleston and Savannah. Um, so I'm not trying to say that those aren't heavy tourist areas, but like for example, the, the site 96. You have to want to go to 96 to go there. It is off the beaten path. It is not right off a major highway. Um, so you have to want to get there. There's also the concept of marketing. It's that economic draw of a site that can influence how much money is spent on trying to attract people to visits because more visits equals you know, more money and therefore more well-known. So you've got sites like Charleston and Savannah. You've got um, Williamsburg. You've got sites that... Um, have the ability to kind of market themselves and get people to show up at the gates. Now, again, these are just some theories I have based on experience and some research, um, but I think they're, these are not the only ones. And I think uh, uh, we could easily have an entire conversation on the cause of these misconceptions. So then it gets to that big question of what do we do about it? And I don't really have an exact or an easy answer to this um, because I think this is a dialogue that we as historians and including the general public in that conversation, um, how, how to do this. We have to have that dialogue amongst ourselves and with educators, with students, with the general public, with various historical sites. We have to just converse and work together to um, keep this history preserved. We have to educate and engage we have to make the history relevant by connecting with the resource in new and different ways. Um, you saw that with the memes I showed earlier, but here we have um, that middle photo, for example, was an event that took place at 96 where we invited artists to come and uh, uh, art in the park where they could create their artistic, um, through their artistic medium, uh, a collection of art pieces that uh, were eventually put on exhibit at the local uh, art gallery. So we've got to try to do things in new and different ways. And we have to continue to study, learn, and understand our history. Even if we think we've studied it all and we know it all, we really don't. We have to continue um, to do this research and to do this study. 
So we as historians and stewards of these stories of the American Revolution, we have a great opportunity in the 250th anniversary. This is our chance to do all the things I mentioned just in the previous slide to begin dispelling these and other misconceptions, to be able to shed light on more unknown, on more of these untold stories, more of these unknown stories, and to eventually bring attention to the importance of understanding this part of our American history. And with that, that's uh, the conclusion of my presentation. And I appreciate you all for sticking with me. And so now I guess I stop sharing my screen. And so that way, um, I guess it's going into uh, questions, if there are any. Great. Uh, well, first, Vanessa, thank you. Uh, that was great. I'm glad to see uh, Florida even made a mention in the- uh, in <laughs> that, that was for uh, you, Phil. That was for you. That was for you. Awesome stuff. Uh, so uh, first question we have for you from uh, Mr. Glenn Williams is actually, uh, speaking of East and West Florida, is it not a misconception, especially currently, that Spain was an American ally. As an ally of France, it was a co-belligerent, but not an ally of the US. We're not the Spanish fighting to restore East and West Florida uh, to Spanish rule, not for Americas. That's good, and Phil, you may be able to, with your background, you may be able to shed uh, more light than me, but I, I'll touch on it a little bit, is that, yeah, even though the Spanish were, um, the Spanish were attacking, say, East and, or West Florida, they, they were really just taking advantage of the situation. Um, of the fact that Britain was at war and they wanted the they wanted their colonies back because um, they had to give them over or they gave them over during um, or after the French and Indian War. But I'm sure you can touch on it a little bit more than I can. Um, do you want to address that a little more? I, I feel like uh, I don't want to rain on your uh, parade here. So this is a <laughs> misconception, but maybe we'll have a breakout session uh, uh, sometime later and we can just talk about Florida Red War, especially Alligator Bridge. It's, it's just a cool name. Yeah, um, that is a cool name. But yeah, um, Spain was not like an identified, not like the French. It wasn't like Spain was on our side and they were sending us resources. No, they were just kind of taking advantage of the situation as best as they could for their own purposes. Um, although I think Spain was um, understanding, like I think they were um, not an ally, but like support it. Like they were like, yeah, go U.S. colonies. Yes, uh, you're kind of right. I mean, they uh, obviously they didn't want this to uh, leak into their counties and get the idea that, yeah, rebellious, but anything that would uh, hurt the British um, and also restore them. Um, and they did regain Florida for, uh, what, 20 years or so, or till uh, eight, the early 1800s when the United States took it over. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, moving on, uh, yeah. could it be like how the story of the pilgrims replaced the story of Jamestown as the beginning of the country after the Civil War since the South? lost is that uh so you want to touch that question that's from uh, james dean do, do i want to touch the question that's the ultimate uh um yeah i mean it's it, there's also a, a and this i didn't really touch on but you know the, the winners write the history and so you have a lot of political activity happening in the northern colonies that at the end of the american revolution who's going to be wanting to write those, those histories down, well, they're gonna wanna talk about all the cool stuff they did. And so, yeah, it could be um, kind of a tie-in to, you know, the winners write the history. Um, I also think that when you were talking about the Civil War, I think that's where a lot of, for the South, and this is just my kind of historical opinion, when you have a, a ton of Civil War battlefields, like Virginia, for example, I was educated in the Virginia public school system there's a lot of focus on civil war. So that kind of overshadows any Rev War history being studied because all the, you know, all the um, resources could go into civil war because we just have a million more civil war battlefield sites. Um, so I think that, that, uh, that very easily civil war battles or civil war engagements in the South overshadow that Rev War history because it's 100, approximately 100 years sooner than that Rev War history. Hopefully that answers. <laughs> no, and uh, yeah, I, more highly literate population uh, as well that leaves notes and, uh, and records. But uh, do you get a sense that there are greater awareness of these lesser known events and locations by people local to areas where they took place? That comes from Blaine M. Thor. Uh, Blaine, that's a great question because I think yes. So um, the specifically in the state curriculum for South Carolina, um, 
up until the most recently, I think oh, last year, January 2020, they actually have it in their state curriculum to talk about the Battle of Cowpens, the Battle of Kings Mountain, the Battle of 97, like it's laid out to talk about these sites. So we got a lot of students or, or, or education groups coming in because it was part of their curriculum. Um, it was a state standard. Uh, I think with the latest update with their uh, curriculum, I don't think that's the case anymore. But definitely all the locals or a lot of locals who grew up, we would get visitors to Cowpens that would say, I came here as, you know, they're you know, gray haired, I came in when I, I came here when I was in fourth grade and da, 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 da. And it's, it's very cool that they have these memories because they came there as kids. But uh, yeah, definitely people local to the area know more than say someone who didn't grow up, um, say in the Carolinas. All right, then uh, from Coral, uh, any connections between North and South sites that could be built on like Harriet Tubman sites in Maryland and New York? Yeah, I think there's definitely that possibility. With the 250th coming up, this is an opportunity for sites across the U.S. to um, share in these common threads that do weave themselves in their stories. You have somebody like Nathaniel Green who spends some time up in Morristown. Okay, so I'll shout out to some, some northern sites. So you have Nathaniel Green who's up in Morristown as a quartermaster. He finds his way down south. So there are obviously... Uh, people and stories that easily link together. And that's kind of the big, um, a big challenge or a big a call to action rather that uh, Northern and Southern sites, whether it's national park service sites, state sites, county sites, uh, uh, private sites, um, that's the big opportunity with the 250th is to be able to um, see how they can share resources, cross promote and help share more and more of these stories. So absolutely there can definitely be um, things built upon and it's up to those sites to do it. Well, perfect. Uh, that is uh, exhausted the questions in the chat here. Um, I'll, if any other questions do come up, Vanessa, we'll be back at the end of the day on the panel. Yep. Uh, but well, thank you, Vanessa, for sharing uh, the misconceptions of the Southern Theater um, outside of Virginia. Uh,